and I'm happy to announce Thomas Enfist. Thomas is Professor for Environmental Research, Resource Management, uh, coming from Stockholm, and he's dealing with ecosystem services, <coughs> land use change, and uh, he was also involved in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, also in the T process, and what is really interesting, at least to me, is you are involved now in ecosystem service analysis for urban areas. And this is interesting since we are also in Natural Capital Germany, we are planning to do a study on urban areas and ecosystem in urban areas. This is highly, particularly interesting for us. So please, Thomas. Thank you very much, Ben, for uh, inviting me to come here uh, to this beautiful spring day in, in Leipzig. Uh, <clears throat> when I was up, said, uh, well, this is my first time here, but that's not really true because I remember that 40 years ago, I was in a, in a Volkswagen van riding from Stockholm to East Germany with seven other young people, bird watchers, and we drove through East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and ended up in Neuseeland Sea in Austria to watch birds. And I kept, <clears throat> must say, driving through this area in, in the early 70s was quite adventurous <laughs> and quite crazy, but we have so many members, and it's great to be back to the city where I was just passing at that time 40 years ago. So, ecosystem services in cities, <clears throat> this was the title I was given by the organizers, so we could argue why you got such a long one and such a short one, what does it mean? <laughs> anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is actually what um, could what are tremendous challenges when it comes to urbanization and how we can understand urbanization and its consequences. But uh, I will also talk about uh, the opportunities, because there are tremendous opportunities uh, when it comes to urbanization and how it relates to biodiversity and ecosystem services. There is, of course, the, the visible part of urbanization, <clears throat> which is urban expansion. And here is here's just a projection of uh, mega cities growing in the world from uh, <coughs> uh, 19, in the end of 1900s to 2015 and, and it will increase from about 8 mega cities to about 80, so that's a tenfold increase and as you see you will have a tremendous increase in South and, and in East Asia. So this is the visible part which <coughs> would reflect in changing land use and changing pressure on, on ecosystems and in fact in the next 50 years we will build more urban area than we've done in, in the entire human history. Uh, some calculations point that we will expand urban areas and, and buildings and constructions uh, into an area which is three, three times the size of France uh, within the next 50 years. So that's a very visible part of urbanization. What is not as visible, and we see it is work, what you see here as yellow are airplanes. And this is a 24 hour expose of connectivity, global connectivity. Uh, <coughs> airplanes that are connecting cities and connecting continents. And you can see soon, boom, Heathrow wakes up. And you can see Europe is <coughs> like an ant's nest. And of course, um, all this connectivity, transfer of humans, information, energy, material, uh, in, in one way represent building a resilience, that you have high connectivity, uh, and individual cities would have many, many links to other uh, urban centers. But on the other side, it also represent um, a risk and a vulnerability, particularly for pandemics, and this is sort of the nightmare scenario for WHO to look at uh, how pandemics actually could very rapidly, within, within a, <coughs> a few hours, or within one or two days, can spread across the, the continent or the globe. So, in a way, urban dependence on ecosystems, it's, it's vast. All the food, the water, whatever uh, people are using are dependent on ecosystems, but it's uh, rarely visible, um, but for example, we can make it visible by pointing out that about one third of the world's largest cities obtain a significant proportion of the drinking water directly from uh, forested and protected areas. And, and there are examples here from Johannesburg, uh, 
Cape Town, Mumbai, Nairobi, and many, many other examples. Uh, but also within cities, um, humans are dependent on ecosystems. And here's one way of creating a typology of uh, ecosystem services uh, in urban areas. Um, there are uh, identified 21 of them. And a very large uh, proportion uh, would be classified as uh, regulating services. I think there's one aspect here of urban ecosystem services which is challenging, but I also think really interesting, and which we need to, to uh, analyze more deeply. And that is that ecosystem services in urban landscapes are produced by an interconnected social ecological system, <coughs> and not by ecosystems alone. We have systems that are so interlinked, so interdependent on each other. So we need to take a very uh, interdisciplinary approach to understand them, to monitor them and to manage them. There have been quite a few attempts of <coughs> quantification of urban ecosystem services, and here are examples from some American and Chinese cities where there's been um, an estimate of um, the quantification of all these services uh, on a per hectare and yearly basis. So you can see, for example, pollution removal, carbon sequestration, stormwater reduction, energy savings, there are these uh, figures produced uh, on a hec per hectare and uh, yearly basis. And since these, some of these them are uh, quite easy to transfer into economic terms, energy savings, for example, or pollution removal, uh, we have some estimates of, uh, actually, of the average value of uh, ecosystem services in US dollar per hectare per year. So, for example, air quality regulation, uh, stormwater reduction, and energy savings, uh, we have some of these estimates. Um, we don't have very many. We, which are related to health in, in the urban area. And I think this is unfortunate, and this is an area which is understudied. Uh, the one measure we have on a per hectare year basis shows that there is a tremendous economic value of uh, urban green space for human health. And, and this is an area we actually need to do much more uh, intensive research to understand. But <clears throat> I think it's one thing to do these kind of economic estimates and analysis, but I think it's just part of the picture when we look at the total value of biodiversity and ecosystem services in the urban landscape, that we have a lot of non-monetary values we also need to think of, and um, here's one, one attempt to try to capture non-monetary values. So we could, for example, uh, imagine uh, that we have an ecological axis going vertically, where we try to create a gradient of ecological values from wastelands or brown fields to, to areas which have very many uh, ecological functions, and we could create uh, another axis horizontally which try to capture social values from areas which are <coughs> perhaps never used uh, it's very in inaccessible to areas uh, which have a diversity of uses and very accessible. And this can create a typology of areas in the urban landscape, um, some of it which would have low ecological and low social values, and then with different variations up to the ones that have high ecological and high, high social value. I think. Um, with this, you could also address uh, interesting transitions. For example, if, if you ident identify brown fields and areas in the urban landscape which, which have very low ecological and low social value, you can start thinking, what can you actually do with that area? Uh, in the urban planning context, well, one trajectory is actually that you start increasing ecological value. You, you do some sort of ecological restoration and eventually increase social value as well. 